In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, both now and into the ages of ages, amen. Glory to thee, our God, glory to thee. O heavenly King, comforter, spirit of truth, who art everywhere, present and fill us all things, treasure your blessings and gear of life, come in abundance and cleanse us from every impurity, and save our souls, a good one. Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and into the ages of ages, amen. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and save us, amen. Thank you, Father, being for being for us. We miss you for a week. Uh, yeah, I, thank you, Father. I, I'm I'm sorry about last week. Uh, it's okay. It's okay. You, the you last hurrah of sickness, hopefully for the winter. We we use that time to to do some of the work uh, with the revelation and touching on other to topics. But uh, I'm glad you're back. So please uh, continue. Okay. Thank you so much, Father, and thank you as always to everyone for joining us. Uh, so last week, if you uh, I'm sorry, two weeks ago, uh, I introduced to you the this body of texts of Saint Ephraim. Graikos, as he is known, or the Greek Ephraim. Um, and uh, th this is this very, very large and, and untranslated work uh, attributed to St. Ephraim the Syrian from the 4th century. It is a body of text that has been read inside of the Orthodox services, particularly during the Lenten services in Orthodox monasteries for 1,700 years. And uh, it was translated into Slavonic early on and exercised a very potent um, uh, influence over Eastern monasticism, both in the Greek and the Slavic worlds for, you know, for all of those years. And yet, as I said before, it is unknown, respectively, in English, uh, with, with limited exceptions. There have been a smattering of small translations done of this. So I am uh, working my way through it, and uh, I'm going to be sharing as my work with you as as often as I can. I don't know if it will take us through the full hour to read what I've gotten so far, but um, I've got about 20 pages And uh, since uh, since what, what we've talked about so far. Um, and uh, we'll just begin with that. So if you recall, the, the if you were here two weeks ago, the opening of the work begins with a kind of conversation about virtues and vices. So he talks about one virtue, such as patience or humility or love, and then he'll give the corresponding vice of that and kind of give a sort of a analysis of it. And it's just very good spiritual reading. And, and because this is a Bible study, I just would like to draw attention, your attention to the fact that it is supremely biblical. Uh, there is frequent uh, quotation from the scriptures inside of it. And like the, the patristic tradition at large, it takes what is in the deposit of the faith found in the scriptures <clears throat> and draws it out and it, and enfleshes it and makes it into a livable set of guidance that we can live in our practical life, okay? Nothing in Orthodox theology ever violates that deposit of faith, it, but it, it does further develop it and bring it out and codify it and, and show how um, the scriptures are to guide us in our life and our spiritual life and in our life of, of doctrine, okay? Because the Christian life ultimately is, is fundamentally composed of these two characteristics. It must be correct faith, what we believe, and it must also be correct practice of what we do, okay? And in, in, in a sense, this duality of, the, uh, of correct belief combined with correct life and correct practice it lays at the heart of all of the arrangement of the different different sundays of great lent uh with the period that we are in right now uh and what do i mean by that well the first two sundays of great lent are devoted to the correct doctrine of the orthodox faith uh for instance the first Sunday of Great Lent is the, is known as the triumph of orthodoxy, when the Orthodox Church upholds and celebrates the triumph of Orthodox theology over the heresy of iconoclasm, which Father Borian has talked a lot about in the past, and we all know what that means. The second Sunday of Great Lent is dedicated to St. Gregory Palamas, who is this great champion of Orthodox theology, in some ways kind of the great synthesizer of all of the patristic tradition that came before him, and uh, and he was the great champion of Orthodoxy over against the errors of Roman Catholicism um, in, in the 14th century. Um, and then we have the Sunday of the Cross, okay? So the Sunday of the Cross is kind of the gateway in between correct belief, the first two Sundays, and, this, and the, the latter two Sundays of Great Lent, which are devoted to repentance, okay? Uh, the next Sunday that we will be celebrating will be St. John of the Latter, okay? St. John Climacus, who wrote his great work, 
the ladder of divine ascent, which teaches us the pathway to overcoming the passions and to acquiring the virtues, to work up and walk up those rungs of the ladder towards heaven. Uh, so this is about our life of repentance. And of course, the Sunday after that, the fifth Sunday of Great Lent, is dedicated to the kind of uh, queen of repentance, in a sense, St. Mary of Egypt, a person who lived a very sinful life, but then repented to a greater degree than almost anybody else in history, and lived for many, many decades in the desert, repenting and fasting and living a life of severe asceticism. And so you, you see this kind of dual nature of correct belief and repentance uh, as being kind of the characteristics of Great Lent. Okay, the first two Sundays being devoted to the correct Orthodox belief and this, these latter two Sundays devoted to repentance and the cross kind of connecting them. Uh, because what is the cross ultimately? It is, it is a symbol of God becoming a man and giving his life for the sake of sinful humanity. And the and the message is repentance. Okay. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, that God has has invaded this world of sin and darkness and has brought himself uh to sinful humanity and, and while offering himself as a sacrifice to the Father and thereby granting us reconciliation. Um and and if I were just to make one more last kind of comparison or connection to the orthodox spiritual tradition of this idea of correct belief and repentance it would be in the shortest but yet most um kind of fundamental prayer of all spiritual life and that is the jesus prayer right lord jesus christ son of god have mercy on me a sinner the first part of that prayer is correct belief right lord jesus christ son of god you have the doctrine of the trinity there you have the doctrine of the incarnation, all in kind of the most uh, shortest and crisp summation. And then the second part of it, have mercy on me, a sinner. This is repentance. So you see this, this duality of correct belief and correct life, repentance. These, this is the ticket, okay? These are the two wings that we can use to fly to heaven, that we need to. We need to have correct belief, and, we also, and that includes a life of the church, um, and uh, along with uh, repentance. Okay, so... With all of that in mind, I would like to uh, now uh, walk you through the, my latest uh, offering, as it were, my latest translation of Sena from the Syrian, and um, and uh, we will see this this duality of correct belief and repentance. Okay, uh, so this is where we left off. I know we read this one concerning love, but but it's a good place to begin. So we, this is this is the virtue of love that he talks about. Blessed is that man in whom there is divine love since God bears this even in himself. For God is love, and he who abideth in love abideth in God. He who has love is superior to all others before God. He who has, not, he who has love has not fear, for love casteth out fear. He never despises anyone, neither small nor great, neither noble nor ignoble, neither poor nor rich, but he is the humble servant of all. He bears all things and endures all things. He who has love is not stirred up against anyone. He is not puffed up. He does not rail at anyone, but turns away even from those railing against him. He who has love does not walk in guile and deceit. He is not made to stumble, nor does he make his brother stumble. He who has love is not envious nor jealous. He does not bear grudges. He does not, bear, he does not rejoice over the falls of others. He does not disparage one who stumbles, but rather shares in his grief and lends him his hand. He does not disregard his brother in need, but rather joins in assisting him and dies together with him. The one who has love does the will of God and is his true disciple. For our good Lord himself says, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. He who has love never stores up anything for himself. He never says anything is his own, but all things whatsoever he has, he offers as the common property of all. He who has love reckons no one a stranger, but rather accounts all people as important to himself. He who has love is not provoked, is not puffed up, is not inflamed to anger, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, 
persists not in lies and considers no one an enemy except the devil alone. He who has love endures all things. He is merciful and long-suffering. Blessed, therefore, is he who possesses love and with it sojourns in the presence of God, since he, recognizing his own, will receive him into his bosom. The worker of love will dwell together with the angels and will reign with Christ. For through love, even God the Logos descended to earth. Through love, even paradise has been opened to us and a way back to heaven has been revealed to all. Through love, we have received reconciliation with God, although we had been his enemies. Fittingly, therefore, do we say that God is love, and he who abideth in love abideth in God. Now concerning the man who does not have love, miserable and wretched is the man who is far away from love. Such a one squanders his days in dreaming. He will not bewail uh, who will not bewail this man since he is far from god and having been deprived of his light dwells in darkness i say to you brothers that he who does not have the love of christ is his enemy he spoke no lie who said whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer and walks in darkness he is easily caught in every sin for he who does not have love is quickly angered quickly provoked to rage and quickly enkindled to hatred he who does not have love gloats over the unrighteousness of others. He who does not he does not have compassion for one who stumbles. He does not stretch out his hand to one who is laid low. He does not exhort one going astray. He does not steady the vacillating. He does not have love. Uh, he who does not have love is maimed in his reasoning. He is a friend of the devil. He is a discoverer of every evil a stirrer up of strife and an abusive friend. He is an associate of slanderers and an ally of detractors. He is a counselor of the envious and an author of contempt. He is a vessel of false pretension. To put it simply, he who does not possess love is a tool of the adversary, and although he errs in every way, he does not even know that he wanders in darkness. Now concerning forbearance. Truly blessed is the man who has come into possession of forbearance, since even the holy scriptures themselves praise such a man, saying the man of forbearance is of great understanding. What indeed is more excellent than this? For the man of forbearance is always in joy, happiness, and exaltation, since he hopes in the Lord. The man of forbearance is outside of anger, since he endures all things. The man of forbearance is not swiftly inflamed to wrath, he is not betaken unto pride. He is not moved easily by inane words. When wronged, he does not grieve. To those in vain against him, he offers no resistance. He is firm in his every deed and is not easily taken captive by deceptions. He is not easily irritated, but rejoices in afflictions and luxuriates in every good work. He welcomes ill will gladly. When given instructions, he does not object and when reproached is not sullen. Thus by forbearance he ever takes care for himself. Now concerning the man who does not have forbearance. Such a man as does not have forbearance is also without the ability to endure. He who does not have forbearance is easily brought to ruin, prone as he is to irritation. Swiftly is he inflamed for battle. He abuses others arrogantly, and he avenges himself when wronged. He engages in fruitless disputes. His actions and deeds are scattered like leaves by the wind. In words, he is in constant, swiftly leaping from one subject to another. The one who does not have forbearance is without stability and is changed quickly. He does not possess discernment. He is disposed to evil. He sits in council with the reviler and joins in assistance with one committing unrighteousness. He cannot keep a secret unhesitating to disclose another's speech. What is more wretched than this? And now concerning endurance. Blessed, O brothers, is whosoever has come into possession of endurance, since endurance contains hope, and hope maketh not ashamed. Truly blessed, therefore, and thrice blessed is the one who has endurance, for he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. And what is better than this good news? Christ is Lord for those who await him. Do you know until what time, brothers, endurance will be determined? 
Or is it ne necessary that I expand my word concerning even this, so that you can become more certain? Endurance is not just one thing, but it is sought in many virtues. The man of endurance partakes of every virtue, for he rejoices in afflictions, and he is approved in his necessities. He is exalted in his temptations, and is unhesitating to persevere. He is adorned in his endurance, and is brought to perfection in love. In the face of arrogance he blesses, in contentions he makes peace, in silence he shows himself courageous, in psalmody untiring, in fasting energetic, in prayers strenuous, in deeds without reproach, in his answers righteous, in carrying out instructions obedient, in establishing his manner of life diligent, in his service to others joyful, and in his behavior most seemly. Among the monastery brethren, he is sweet and in his, in his advice pleasant. He is joyful in his vigils and makes haste to care for strangers. In his care for the weak, he is diligent and is the first to run to those in difficult circumstances. He is sober in his reasoning and alert in his every action. The man possessing endurance has come into the possession of hope, for such a man is adorned by every good deed. Wherefore, such a man will call upon the Lord with boldness, saying, I waited enduringly for the Lord, and he heard me. Now concerning the man who does not have endurance. Wretched and miserable is the man who does not possess endurance. For the divine scriptures threaten woe to such as these, as they say, Woe unto you who have lost endurance. Truly indeed, woe to the one who does not have endurance, since such a man is blown like leaves by the wind. He bears pride and is contemptuous in afflictions. Such a man is easily taken captive in altercations, grumbles when he must endure anything, and talks back when under obedience. He is lazy in his prayers and inattentive in vigils. He is sullen during the fasts and heedless in maintaining self-control. He is evasive in his answers and wicked in his deeds. He is unconquered in his cunning and imperious in his daily habit of life. In verbal disputes he is vehement and is powerless to remain in silence. Such a one is a contrarian to those who hold a good reputation and is envious of those making progress. He who does not have endurance is afflicted with many losses, and such a man is unable to lay hold of virtue. For through endurance we run the race set before us, as the Apostle says. He who does not have endurance is estranged from this hope. Wherefore I call upon you all, as many as are as an unenduring as I am, to lay hold of endurance in order that you may be saved. Now concerning gentleness. Blessed is that man who is not angered easily, nor vents his spleen. Such a one is always at peace, and since he drives away from himself this peevish and irascible spirit, he is far removed from hostilities and disturbances. He is ever in a calm spirit and has joy on his face. He who is not quick, quickly angered is not stirred up by empty speech. Such a man is a worker of righteousness and truth. Such a man easily holds fast and easily endures those who talk till their tongues ache. He commits injustice to no one. Feebleness does not afflict him. He does not rejoice in altercations. He shows himself as loving to all. The kind of man... Uh, this kind of man does not rejoice in contentions. Such a man is always of a sound constitution. He rejoices in peace and abides in forbearance. He does not easily give way to the spirit of irascibility, but he becomes the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. The man not having the spirit of irascibility does not grieve the Holy Spirit. This man is able both to be mild and to be able to have love, patience, and humility. The man of gentleness is adorned with every good deed and is befriended by Christ. Truly thrice blessed, therefore, is the man who ever drives away from himself the spirit of anger and indignation, since the body, soul, and mind of this man ever farewell. Now concerning the irascible man. Let the man who is ever overpowered by irascibility and who is angered both often and quickly on account of trifles Hear what the Holy Apostle James says, the wrath of God, sorry, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. 
Truly wretched and miserable is the man overcome by such passions as these. For the anger, angry man kills his own soul. Indeed, the angry man kills and destroys his own soul, since such a man always lives in disturbances and is far removed from tranquility. Such a man is not only estranged from peace, but is far removed even from physical health, for always is his body possessed, his soul aggrieved, his flesh wasted away, his complexion pallid, his reasoning perturbed, his mind debilitated, and his thoughts gushing over like a river. He is hateful towards everyone. Such a man is far removed from forbearance and love. Amid idle words he is easily disturbed, and he stirs up altercations on account of trifles. Even when there is no need for him to do so, he involves himself, and in this way accumulates ill will. Such a man rejoices in chattering and jumps at the opportunity for useless actions. Such a man takes pleasure in insults. Such a man is weak in gentleness, though vehement in cunning. Who would not grieve for such a man, since before God and men he is detestable? In every way is the irascible man wretched. Wherefore, you too restrain yourselves from irascibility. And now concerning meekness. Truly blessed is the man, and thrice blessed who possesses meekness. For our holy Lord and Savior extolled such a man, when he said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What is more blessed than this blessedness? What is superior to this promise? What is more splendid than this joy of inheriting the land of paradise? Wherefore, brethren, having heard the exceeding measure of the riches of the promise, be zealous to pursue it with all haste. Be swift-footed towards the splendor of virtue. Having heard of it, accomplish it as far as possible, and make haste, lest someone else become an inheritor of this land instead, and you weep bitterly, repenting but to no avail. Having heard the beatitude pronounced upon meekness, hasten towards it, having heard also what the truthful Isaiah utters in the Holy Spirit. On whom will I rest but upon the meek and the tranquil, and the one who trembles at my words? Is, not, is it not fitting to marvel at this promise? For what is more glorious than this honor? Mark well, therefore, brethren, lest anyone fall from this blessedness and this measureless joy and exaltation. Contend earnestly, therefore, contend, I beseech you, lay hold of meekness, for the meek man is adorned with every good deed. The meek man rejoices even if he is assaulted. He gives thanks even if he is afflicted. Through love he mollifies those angered. He remains firm, though upbraided. In conflict he is calm, though under the imposition of others he exults. He is not pricked by the goads of another's arrogance, but rejoices even in moments of humiliation. In virtuous actions he does not exalt himself nor boast. He comports himself in stillness before all. He tempers himself submissively to the commands of superiors. He is ready for every work and holds good repute in them all. He is praised by all. In everything external, he is far removed from hypocrisy. Such a man is not a slave to deceit, nor is governed by envy. He turns himself away from insults and does not pay heed to calumny. He flees from detractors and turns away from slanderers. Oh, the blessed riches of meekness, which is glorified by all. And now concerning wickedness. Ponaria is the Greek word. To, which is the same word, incidentally, that is used of the devil in uh, the end of the Lord's Prayer. You know, ala rise emasa potu poniru, deliver us from the evil one. So it's the same word here. To be lamented and wept over, therefore, brethren, are those who do not possess meekness, and who moreover are yoked to wickedness, since they are subject to a heavy judgment. For it is written, the wicked shall be utterly destroyed together. Our holy God censures such men as these when he says, An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. Likewise the prophet says, Mine ear shall hear the wicked that rise up against me. Terrible is the demon of wickedness, my brothers. Wherefore stand fast in prayer, lest anyone making himself his own enemy causes himself to become blameworthy. The wicked man is never at peace, but is always in disturbance. He is always full of belligerence, trickery, and anger. He always gazes steadfastly at the one most near to him, 
He's always whispering, always envying, always jealous, always disturbed, always contradicting the directives of superiors and twisting their commands. He is given good counsel and spurns it so as to do wrong. He is put together, but then tears himself apart. He is loved, but scoffs at it. He loathes those who have a good reputation. He is disgusted at those making progress. He makes light of admonitions. He sets one brother against another. He vexes the simple. He repulses the meek. He mocks the forbearing. He hypocritically puts on airs before visitors. He makes false accusations about others in private, but in reality he stands opposed to each and every one. He is impelled toward alter altercations. He is stirred to irritation. He impels others to seek vengeance. He is ready with insults. He takes pleasure in slander. He is prone to contention, aggressive to make idle chatter, prone to hitting, and the first to run towards an uproar. He is powerless to recite psalms, lax in keeping the fast, impotent and useless in every good work, and lethargic towards spiritual conversations, since every iniquity shuts up his mouth. Such a man is worthy of much lamentation. Wherefore, I beseech you, brethren, to be on guard against wickedness. And now concerning truth. Blessed is the man who harmonizes his life with the truth and is not taken captive in any lie. Blessed and thrice blessed is he who becomes a worker of truth, since God is truth, and there is no lie in him. Who would not call the man who preserves the truth blessed, since such a man is an imitator of God, in him, in that he is always truthful, is pleasing to God, and is of service to all men? Within the brotherhood he is cheerful, and in every action forthright. The man of truth is not a respecter of persons and he does not judge with unjust judgment. He does not show preference for rank or positions of honor, nor does he look askance at poverty and destitution. He is without guile in his answers and is upright in his determinations. He is conscientious, conscientious in his work and is held in honor by the whole community of brethren. He knows nothing of craftiness. He is not enamored of hypocrisy. He is adorned by every good work and is governed by every virtue. Blessed, therefore, is the man who is ever a slave of truth. And now concerning falsehood. Wretched and miserable is the man who persists in every falsehood, since the devil is a liar from the beginning. He who persists in falsehood is utterly devoid of boldness before God. He is detestable before God and men. Who would not bewail the man who lives in falsehood? For such a one is discredited in every deed and suspect in every answer. Such a man stirs up fights and altercations in the monastery and in the community of the brethren is like rust on iron. He has an insolent heart and does not control himself. He gladly hears secrets and then readily reveals them. He knows how to use his tongue to upset those who stand well. He instigates an affair and then makes a pretense of innocence. He says nothing without swearing oaths, and from the, his much speaking seems persuasive. The liar is versatile and full of machinations. There is no greater wound of the soul than this, and no greater disgrace. He is odious to all and a laughing stock before all. Wherefore, brethren, restrain yourselves from persisting in falsehood. And now concerning obedience. Blessed is the man who has come into possession of and retains obedience that is true and unhypocritical, because such a man is an imitator of our holy teacher, who was obedient unto death. Truly blessed, therefore, is the man who has obedience, because since he is an imitator of the Lord, he becomes a joint heir with him. He who has obedience towards all has been united to love. He who has obedience has obtained a great possession and great riches. The obedient man is pleasing to all. He is praised by all, and he is glorified by all. He who is obedient is quickly exalted and will quickly make progress. The obedient man is given an assignment and does not talk back. He is given instructions and does not distort them. He is placed under a penance and does not become angry. He is prepared for every good deed. He is not easily taken captive by irascibility. If he is rebuked, he is not disturbed and if subjected to another's arrogance, he is not inflamed. 
He rejoices in pains, and in tribulations he gives thanks. He does not change from place to place. It does not go from monastery to monastery. Being admonished, he is not alarmed. He remains in the place in which he was called and is not held down by listlessness. He does not disparage his father superior nor belittle his brethren. He does not shun the monastery's habit of life. He does not find joy in respites nor delight in the pleasantness of places and the open air. But in accordance with the command of the holy apostle, he abides in the place in which he was called. Many, therefore, in truth, are the fruits of obedience, and on this account, blessed is the man who has acquired it. Now concerning disobedience and grumbling. Accursed and miserable is he who has not come to possess obedience, but rather grumbling. The grumbler is a mo in a monastery is a great wound, a scandal to the community, a toppling of love, a dispersal of concord, and a disturbance of peace. The grumbler, when given instructions, contradicts. He is useless in work. Such a man never has gratitude, since he is slothful, and slothfulness is yoked to grumbling. Every slothful man falls into evils, as the Holy Scripture says. For it says, when the slothful man has been sent out, he saith there is a lion in the ways, and murderers in the streets. The grumbler is always thus making excuses. If he has been dis been ordered to do a job, he grumbles and straightway even distracts the others, saying, What is the purpose of this? What is this for? This is of no use. If he does finally trickle into the road, he says that there are great dangers lurking out there. If they wake him for the singing of psalms, he is indignant. If for vigil, he asserts that his stomach hurts and his head. If you admonish him, he says, Take thought for yourself, and it will be with me as God wills. If you try to teach him anything, he says, if only you knew as much as I know. Never does he work alone, unless he can drag another along. Every work of a grumbler is unseemly and useless, and unfitted to every virtue. The grumbler rejoices in rest, and does not take delight in maltreatment. The grumbler takes pleasure in meals, and abhors the fast. The grumbling, slothful man knows how to whisper, and how to contrive rumors. Such a man is versatile, full of artifice, and unconquered in the multitude of his words. Such a man is always slandering one person to another. He is sullen when performing good deeds, and not at all serviceable in the reception of guests. In charity he is a hypocrite, but in hate he is vehement. Wherefore, brethren, let us not grumble in the performance of the duties laid upon us, nor let us dispute or litigate with our superiors as if we knew better. Now concerning one who does not have envy or jealousy. So we in modern day English, we use the terms jealousy and envy kind of synonymously, but there is a distinction to be made. Uh, jealousy is technically when you want, you, you have something that you have, something that you possess, you don't want to give up. And you're going to like not share basically kind of like that sort of thing. Whereas envy is you you don't have something that somebody else has and you want to take it away from them and make it yours. Okay, that's so this is there's a slight distinction here. Um blessed is he who is not subjected to envy and jealousy. Jealousy and envy depend upon one another. He who has one of these has the sum of them. Truly blessed, therefore, is he who has not fallen among these, nor has been wounded by one of them. For the jealous man who judges his brother by an unjust judgment will be condemned with the devil. The jealous man is vanquished. He has hatred. He has enmity. And he is vexed at the progress of others. He who does not have envy or jealousy is never pained at the progress of others. When another is honored, he is not disturbed. When another is exalted, he is not dismayed. For he considers all superior to himself. He honors all before himself. He considers himself unworthy and the least of all. He considers all greater than himself and all better than himself. The man without envy does not court honor. He rejoices with those who rejoice. He never seeks to bestow glory upon himself. He joins in assisting those making progress. He is happy for those walking well, and he praises those living well. If he sees a brother living uprightly, he does not impede him, but encourages such a man to even better things with words of exhortation.
If he sees another making ascent, he does not slander him, but celebrates him. If he sees a brother stumbling, he does not ridicule him, but corrects him meekly. If he sees someone angry, he does not lay further disturbance upon him, but calms such a one with love, speaking with him in peace. If he sees one in pain, he does not turn away, but suffers with him and helps him with consoling words. If he sees one who is ignorant and inexperienced, he hastens to teach such a man and to instruct him in what is profitable. If he sees a man who is erring, he unbegrudgingly directs him to the right way. If he sees one sleeping during the singing of psalms, he quickly wakes up such a man. To put it simply, the man who is without envy and who is far removed from jealousy gives no offense to his neighbor in any action, but rejoices in his every bit of progress and acquisition of virtue. Now concerning envy and jealousy. Wretched is the man caught up in this, since he wounds himself. He is a partaker with the devil, through whom death came into the world. He who has envy and jealousy stands opposed to all, since he desires to have himself be honored before another. He makes light of those who have a good reputation, and he places stumbling blocks in the way of those walking well. He finds fault with those living uprightly, and finds the devout man detestable. He calls the man who fasts vainglorious, and the man who is earnest in the singing of psalms ostentatious. One who is prompt in refectory service he calls gluttonous, and a man who is lively in his works a luster after glory. He calls the man who loves his work unlearned in the scriptures, and the one who is temperate in his responses a man surrendered to his stomach. Never does the envious man rejoice in the progress of another, if he sees one who is not taking sufficient care, he does try to rouse him, but rather, um, I'm sorry, he does not try to rouse him, but rather urges him to further evil. When he sees one sleeping at the time of prayer, he does not wake him up, but rather keeps extra quiet. If he sees a brother resting, he slanders him. If he sees him in trespasses, he disparages him before all. Now concerning the man who does not revile. So the word to revile here, this is the same word that the King James Bible translates as to rail. Okay, a person who rails against another. Or, or a, a reviler is a railer. Blessed and thrice blessed is the man who has not harmed his tongue by reviling others, and through his tongue has not defiled his heart. But rather, knowing that we are all to be treated with respect, takes no delight in reviling others. On the contrary, he is wroth when such a passion, with such a passion itself. For the man who does not rail against another has preserved himself blameless. Offense does not occur to such a man, and his conscience is not scalded. The man who flees from the spirit of reviling has guarded himself from the snare of evils and has conquered the phalanx of the demons. He who does not possess a reviling tongue possesses an inviolate treasure. He who is not inclined towards the reviling of others has escaped fratricide and will not be reviled by others. He who, ha who, he who is not captured by the spirit of reviling truly knows what he is, a human being made of flesh and blood, and has preserved himself spotless. He who does not sit in council with revilers dwells with the angels, he who has not poisoned his ear and tongue with reviling is full of the elixir of love. The mouth of a man who does not pollute it with reviling emits a sweet savor of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Truly blessed, therefore, and again blessed, is the man who has guarded himself from reviling. And now concerning reviling and those who revile. He who takes pleasure in reviling others is clearly himself a captive of those things which he inveighs against others, since he who reviles another condemns himself. He is a carnal man entangled in the nets of the world. The man of reviling is enclosed on all sides by slander, by hatred, and by whispering. Such a man is therefore judged as a fratricide, as one having shut up his bowels of compassion, and as unmerciful. He who ever has the fear of God within himself and his heart pure does not rejoice in the reviling of others, nor does he take pleasure in another's secrets, nor become smug at the fall of others. Truly worthy, therefore, of lamentation and mourning is he who has devoured himself 
in reviling. What can be graver than this hatred? Wherefore even the holy apostle, when mentioning the deeds of wickedness, numbers together with them also the man of reviling, saying that neither the reviler nor the covetous shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now concerning self-control. This is the same word that is usually translated as temperance, okay? But temperance, of course, as we all know in American history, has a secondary meaning referring to just not drinking alcohol, but this is more uh, general about all things. Truly blessed and thrice blessed is the man who has preserved self-control, because this is without doubt a great virtue. But here now, until what point and to what extent and towards what thing self-control is so called, and adjudged and sought out. Self-control of the tongue is when one is not dragged along by excessive and empty words, but masters his tongue, and does not revile, does not insult, does not curse, does not speak idly, nor with words that are unseemly. Mastery over the tongue means not slandering others in private, nor not criticizing a brother, not divulging secrets, and not being curious about things that are not one's own business. There is also self-control of hearing, which is having mastery over inclining one's ears to vain things. There is a self-control of the eyes, which is having mastery of one's sight, not fixing one's gaze on or examining closely whatever one's pleasure bids him towards, nor at things that are unseemly. There is self-control of emotions, to have mastery over one's anger, and not becoming quickly inflamed. There is self-control of dignity, having master over one's mind, not wanting to be held in honor, not seeking glory, nor to be exalted, nor to seek honor, nor being puffed up. There is self-control of one's thoughts, to chasten them with the fear of God, and neither assent to nor enjoy a seductive and smoldering thought. There is self-control of eating, to have mastery over not seeking excessive nor sumptuous foods, nor eating at an unappointed time of uh, hour or time of day, not being bound by the spirit of gluttony, not being insatiable before the beauty of foods, nor yearning after new varieties of food. There is self-control in drinking, which is to have mastery over one's consumption of wine and the pleasure one takes in wine not being satiated with wine, nor seeking a variety of either drink or the pleasures of concocting mixtures, and not making immoderate use of not only wine, but even of water also, if it is possible. There is self-control of appetite and illicit pleasure, which is mastering one's sense perceptions, not, not succumbing to random impulses, not assenting to thoughts suggesting excess, not taking delight in uncleanness, not performing the will of the flesh, but rather bridling the passions with the fear of God. For truly the man of self-control is that man who sustains his desire for the immortal goods of heaven and redirects his earthly appetites towards them, looking intently upon them with his mind. He despises intercourse as being some mere shadow, nor does he rejoice in the faces of women. He does not take delight in bodies. He does not collapse before beauty. He does not revel in ephemeral pleasures, he is not enticed by words of flattery. He does not persist in familiarity with women, especially indecent ones. He does not spend a long time in the company of women. The man of self-control is truly courageous, guarding himself against unmeasured relaxation, controlling himself in regard to every thought, in regard to every pleasure, uh, every desire, mastering himself by a desire of something greater and by a fear of the age to come. Now concerning lack of self-control. The intemperate man who does not possess self-control is easily taken captive in every offense. The intemperate man is a lover of pleasure. The intemperate man takes pleasure in many empty words. He takes delight in idle talk and buffoonery. He takes delight in the pleasure of foods. He displays his manhood in much eating and drinking and is exercised in vain pleasure. He ascends to impure thoughts, he indulges in pleasure, he yearns for glory, he fantasizes about honor as if it had already been taken in hand. In chance encounters with women, he beams with joy, melting before their beauty, invigorated at the sight of their bodies, and bewitched by their kindliness. 
In the company of women and their exciting laughter, he is riveted. He fantasizes, recollecting their looks, and is mastered by his, his reminiscences. He depicts the faces of women in his mind, the touching of their hands, the clasping of their bodies, the embracing of their limbs, their empathetic words, their charming laughter, their fetching glances, the adornment of their clothing, the sight of their bodies, their flattering banter, the pursing of their lips, the general pleasantness of their bodies, the adumbrations of their movements, the times and places of their mutual encounters, and all things whatsoever that incline toward pleasure. These things the lover of pleasure and the one who does not have self-control depict in their minds and form in their thoughts. Such a man as this, if he should see some scripture concerning self-restraint, becomes sullen. If he should see a beneficial gathering of the fathers, he shuns and rejects it. If he beholds the austerity of the fathers, he is disgusted. If he hears about fasting, he becomes agitated. He takes no delight in friendly meetings with the brethren, but he beams with delight if he sees women. He runs up and down to be at their service. Then he is found to be vigorous for the chanting of psalms, vigorous to be witty, vigorous to laugh, all so that he might show himself forth pleasing, attractive, and charming to the women present. In stillness he is glowering and weak, wretched therefore and miserable, is he who does not have self-control in every way and every action. Wherefore, brethren, having heard of the fruits of self-control and of the chaff of disobedience, let us free from the latter and cling to the former, for great is the recompense of self-control and there is no end of its majesty. Truly blessed, therefore, is the man who possesses self-control. Blessed is he who has numbered himself among every virtue, and has earnestly sought to shine forth in the works of righteousness. And blessed is he who has not made hidden what he has done displeasing to God, but has served with all truth. All his actions have been brought to light, and he has not conformed himself to every thought, counseling vain things. And what shall I do? Now, having praised every virtue, yet having behaved in accordance with none of them, and having spent my years in every evil, Fulfilled in me is that which is written, Ye laid men with heavy burdens, grievous to be borne, and ye yourselves touch not the burdens with one of your fingers. Wherefore I call upon the love of all of you, O blessed of Christ, and partakers of paradise. Earnestly strive to please Christ, the one who enlisted you, lest any one of you be utterly ruined as one contemptuous and negligent. As many of you as serve by the grace of Christ beneath his yoke, Refrain from performing the de desires of the flesh, in order that we may not be found without excuse before the dread judgment seat, in which each man will be requited, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Woe to them, woe to me then, because I am going to stand there bereft of boldness of speech. What will I do in that hour of inexorable necessity? Blessed then will be as many as stand before the judge with boldness, who are going to receive from the hand of the Lord a holy recompense. Woe to those then who are ashamed on account of their minimal and fruitless activity. I tell you this, what sort of defense will there be for the man in, in, indicted for the love of glory, or for irascibility, or for disobedience, or for dis indiscipline, or for gluttony, or for petulance, or for loquacity, or for arrogance, or for smug self-satisfaction, or for boastfulness, or for envy, or for strife, or for contentiousness, or for reviling, or for slander. What sort of defense will there be for one indicted on account of the least of these? What sort of profit or what sort of pleasure will there be for you from these? What difficulty will there be to avoid them? Wherefore I beseech, brethren, that none of you be condemned for any of these, for I know well how to strengthen you concerning heavy sins, but each one of you is accustomed to scorn those which appear small, thinking there will be no trial for these. Through these, however, the devil takes you captive, for he makes each of you scorn them as of no importance, but contend zealously that you not be taken captive in these, and guard yourselves with all heedfulness so that you may be glorified with Christ. To him be due glory 
unto the ages of ages. Amen. Now, that actually is the end of the first part of volume one, uh, the dialogue on virtues and vices. There is now the second uh, part, and there's many parts. It's just, uh, you know, that it's a rather lengthy part. So that was 13 pages right there. Um, now, this next part, uh, I would like to I would like to read. It will take about fifteen minutes, but I, I think that's okay. I think we still have time. I'll maybe I'll read it somewhat quickly. It is very very moving and very beautiful. It's it's the saint's own kind of, well, just what it says: self reproof and confession. Take pity on me, O brethren, who do not shut up the bowels of your compassion, for the divine scriptures did not speak idly when they said, "A brother helped by a brother is as a strong and high city." and is as, a, is as strong as a well-founded palace. Again it says, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Receive therefore, O chosen of God, an entreaty from one who pledged himself to please God, but who lied to the one who made him, so that through your prayers of supplication I may be extricated from the sins surrounding me, and being restored to health, I may be roused from the bed of putrid sin. From my childhood, I have been a useless and abject vessel. And now hearing about the judgment, I disdain it as if I were superior to uh, <clears throat> um, my sinful falls and defects, admonishing others to hold back from things unprofitable, though perpetrating those very things myself twice as much. Alas, for I stand in such condemnation. Alas, for I lie prostrate in such shame. Alas, for there is nothing in me hidden which will not be manifest. Wherefore, unless merciful men of God illumine something in me quickly, there is no hope for me of salvation from my works. For although holding forth concerning purity, I ponder licentiousness. Although uttering words concerning dispassion, the rumination of shameful passions is in me day and night. What kind of defense, therefore, will I have? Alas, for what sort of judgment lies in store for me? Truly, I have the outward appearance of piety, yet I lack its power. With what countenance, therefore, will I approach the Lord God, who knows the secret things of my heart? Being answerable for such great wickedness, I am afraid when I stand in prayer, lest fire come down from heaven and consume me. For if fire coming from forth from the Lord burnt up those who offered up strange fire in the desert, what shall I expect, who am beset by so great a burden of trespasses? What then? Shall I despair of my salvation? God forbid. This too is the endeavor of the adversary. Whenever he leads one into despair, he eventually brings him down into death. I do not despair of myself, since I take courage from the tender mercies of God and from your intercessions. Therefore do not desist from praying to God, who loves mankind, that my heart may be freed from slavery to base passions. My heart has become stone, my once pious way of thinking has been altered, and my reasoning has become darkened. I return like a dog to its vomit. I have no pure repentance, I have no tears in prayer, and if I sigh, I dry my face, suffused only with shame. I smite my breast, the dwelling place of the passions. Glory to thee, O God, who sustains me, Glory to thee, O long-suffering one. Glory to thee, who art patient of my evils. Glory to thee, O good one. Glory to thee, O only wise one. Glory to thee, O benefactor of our souls and bodies. Glory to thee, who maketh thy son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Glory to thee, O thou, who nourisheth all nations and all human nature as if it were a single man. Glory to thee who nourisheth the birds of heaven, the beasts, creeping things, and creatures that live in the water, as if they were all a single paltry sparrow. For all wait on thee to give them their food in due season. Great is thy power, O Lord, and thy tender mercies are over all thy works. Wherefore I pray, O Lord, that thou mightest not cast away me with those who say to thee, Lord, Lord, but do not do thy will, through the intercessions of all those who have been well-pleasing in thy sight. For thou knowest the passion hidden inside me. Thou knowest the wounds of my soul. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Contend alongside me in your prayers, brothers. Beseech tender mercies from the goodness of, of God. 
my soul made bitter by sins, sweeten from the true vine, since you are his branches. Give me who am thirsty to drink from the fountain of life, you who have already been deemed worthy of, of it. Enlighten my soul, you who have become sons of light. Direct me who am wandering on the path of life, you who are persevering on it. Lead me into the royal gate as a master does his slave, you who have become heirs of the kingdom, since my heart is hindered. May the tender mercies of God come upon me through your entreaties before I am dragged away by those who work iniquity. There shall the things done in darkness and the things done in light be revealed. What shame will seize me when they who now ceaselessly assert that I am beyond reproach behold me condemned? Omitting spiritual labor, I am obedient to the passions. <clears throat> I refuse to be taught, and yet I want to teach. I refuse to submit, and yet I expect others to, uh, to submit to me. I refuse to become weary, and yet I expect others to weary themselves. I refuse to perform tasks, and yet I want to be a taskmaster. I refuse to honor, and yet I want to be honored. I do not want to be reproached, and yet I want to reproach others. I do not want to be disdained as nothing, and yet I disdain others. I do not want to bear the arrogance of others, and yet I delight in treating others arrogantly. I do not want to be proved, and yet I want to prove others. I do not want to be merciful, and yet I demand mercy. I do not want my faults to be found out, and yet I want to be a fault finder. I do not want to be wronged, and yet I want to wrong others. I do not want to be harmed, and yet I demand to harm others. I do not want to be slandered, and yet I want to slander. I do not want to listen, and yet I want to be heard. I do not want to celebrate others, and yet I demand to be celebrated. I do not want to be governed, and yet I want to govern. I am wise at admonishing, but not in doing. I say what needs to be done, and I do what is not right even to say. Who would not weep for me? Weep for me, as many as are righteous as for one who was conceived in iniquity. Weep for me, ye lovers of light and haters of darkness, as for one who loves the works of darkness. Weep for me, uh, who are ye who are approved, as for one reprobate. Weep for me, ye who are merciful and pardoning, as for one who received mercy, but who still provokes it. Weep for me, ye who have come to be above all reproach, as for one sunk in iniquities. Weep for me, ye lovers of good and haters of evil, as for one who loves evil things and hates good. Weep for me, ye who have come into possession of a virtuous life, as for one who only has, an, has in outward appearance abandoned worldly life. Weep for me, ye who are pleasing to God, as for one who is a man-pleaser. Ye who have come into possession of perfect love, weep for me who love my neighbor in words, but hate him in deeds. Weep for me, ye who take care for yourselves, as for one who meddles in the affairs of others. Weep for me, ye who possess forbearance and bear fruit for God, as for one who is without forbearance and fruitless. Weep for me, ye who have craved knowledge and instruction, as for one ignorant and useless. Weep for me, ye who approach God having no cause for shame, as for one unworthy of looking steadfastly and beholding the height of heaven. Weep for me, ye who have come into possession of the gentleness of Moses, as for one who has willingly lost this. Weep for me, <clears throat> ye who have come into possess the chastity of Joseph, as for one who has abandoned this. Weep for me, ye who have the ye who love the, the self control of Daniel as for one voluntarily deprived of this. Weep for me, ye who possess the patience of Job, as for one rendered alienated from this. Weep for me, ye who possess the voluntary poverty of the apostles, as for one far removed from this. Weep for me, ye faithful and steadfast at heart towards the Lord, as for one parched, craven, and unseemly. Weep for me, ye that love mourning and have shaken off laughter, as for one laughter-loving and a hater of mourning. Weep for me, ye that have preserved the temple of God without blemish, as for one who has defiled and befouled it. Weep for me, 
Ye who ever hold in memory the separation of the soul from the body and the inevitable road that we all must traverse, as for one unmindful and unprepared for his departure. Weep for me, ye that hold in your mind the judgment after death, as for one who agrees to remember it and yet does things contrary. Weep for me, ye heirs of the kingdom of the heavens, as for one worthy of the fire of Gehenna. Alas, since sin has not allowed one member in me to remain whole, nor any sensation which is not corrupted. The end stands at the doors, brothers, and yet I do not take care. Behold, I have revealed to you the wounds of my soul, so do not spurn my pathetic state, but pray to the physician concerning my weakness, pray to the shepherd concerning his sheep, pray to the king concerning this captive, pray to life concerning this corpse, that I may obtain salvation in Christ Jesus our Lord from the sins which beset me, and that he may send his grace and may strengthen the vacillation of my soul. For I am prepared to resist the passions, and yet, in contending against them, the cunning artifices of the serpent dissolve the firmness of my soul through pleasure, and I am taken captive by them. Again am I eager to rip away that which burns me, and yet the scent of the fire, as when I was still young, draws me toward the flame. Again I rush headlong to save one plunged into the sea, and from lack of experience I am plunged in together with him. Desiring to become a physician of the passions, I myself am subdued by them, and instead of healing, I become the one worn out with illness. I, I, being blind myself, attempt to lead the blind. Wherefore, I will need many prayers, that I may know my limitations, so that the grace of God may overshadow me and enlighten my darkened heart, and so that instead of ignorance, divine knowledge may dwell in me, for no word of God shall be void of power. He himself rendered the impassable sea passable for his people. He himself rained down manna upon them, and from the sea quails like the sand of the seas. He himself brought forth water from a precipitous rock for those thirsting. He himself alone, by his own goodness, saved the one who had fallen among thieves. May his goodness also be moved with compassion upon me, who fall into sins and am bound as if with a chain by wickedness. I do not have boldness of speech before him who tries the hearts and reins. There is no one who can heal the pain of my soul except him who knows the depths of the heart. How many times have I placed boundaries on myself, erected walls between myself and lawless sin, and yet when enemies have arrayed themselves against me for war, my reasoning transgressed those boundaries and tore down those walls on account of those boundaries, not having the fortification of the fear of the one who is mightier, and since those walls were not grounded on sincere repentance. Wherefore, even now I knock, so that it may be opened unto me. I persist in prayer, so that I may obtain my request. As one shameless I seek mercy, O Lord. Thou offerest good things, O Savior, but I give back evil things in return. Be thou long-suffering towards me, who am wicked. I am not worthy of forgiveness for my idle words, but I ask from thy goodness remission of even my unholy deeds. Free me, O Lord, from every evil deed before the end seizes me, so that I may find grace in thy sight in the hour of death, for in Hades who will confess thee. Save my soul, O Lord, from the dread of what is to come, and make my garment pure white on account of thy tender mercies and thy goodness, so that I, even the unworthy, being made to shine, may be accounted worthy of the kingdom of the heavens, and coming into the indescribable joy, I may say, Glory to thee, who has rescued my afflicted soul from the mouth of the lion, and placed me in the paradise of, the, of delight. For to thee, the all-holy God, is due glory unto all the ages. Amen. Okay, my friends, I think that's a good place to put a stop in it. I actually have done more, but it's it's a lot. Uh, and uh, I'd be happy to take any questions or if you have any comments, reactions, anything that wasn't clear, uh, please, uh, your feedback is value, very valuable to me. Thank you, Father. Uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to... Um... 
to ask, just to mute yourself. We can have a conversation. Sometimes we can have uh, just maybe a Q&A about certain topics. <clears throat> but thank you, Father. This was uh, very good and important to hear, especially in during the time of the Great Lent. It, it is really ideal reading for Lent, actually, you know? Yes. Uh, yes. You know, just the tremendous, uh, you know, sense of repentance and, uh, you know, um, you know, focusing on on virtue, acquiring virtue, and and uh, avoiding vice. It's got it's got everything. Yes. Uh, okay. Let me see here. Yeah, we we are God willing, uh, continuing to have the services, uh, of course, every every day of the of the week, uh, the Lenten hours when this. The prayer of Saint Ephraim of Syria is always part of it. Yes, of course. Yeah, um, well, in, I'm sorry, Father. Go ahead, please. Yo, I, I was, you know, no, no, it's okay. I'm just saying, just it's it's always to to know more and more about uh, the life of those saints who, just the, the very power of the of the their words lies not so much in the in their eloquence and the ability to kind of convey the the in beautiful words in syntax the wisdom of, of their life but you can see there is power because it's the holy spirit lived in these people and they yes. speak with an authority yes yeah. so their inner life you can kind of feel the energy even though if you try to analyze the prayer it's not something spectacular from a right. let's right. say linguistic poetic or whatever but it has such a tremendous power from within especially when it's said in a, in, in a pious way um yeah, fits right uh, in with St. Andrew's canon, uh, stings, it gives uh, great hope. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that's true. And actually, the, Mark, that's uh, so good to hear from you. I haven't, uh, I feel like I haven't spoken to you in a long time. Uh, I hope you're doing well. Um, but it, it, like this canon of St. Andrew, if you, I'm sure you, you probably picked up on this. His, he, he, obviously, he's very familiar with the New Testament, but you can see his exemplar. He are always seem to be drawn primarily from the Old Testament, you know, uh, of virtues and vices, and um, and that, that I find that to be interesting because you know th there is there is scholarly debate. We're not really sure to what degree the actual Saint Ephraim the Syrian is the author of these texts, but um, the, the the Syriac works, which are indisputably by him, uh, make a lot of. Uh, there you can see he's very at home inside of the Old Testament. He knows all of these figures and stuff that you really would have to know the, the Bible, you know, the Old Testament quite well to be able to know them, and uh, that makes perfect sense. You know, he he was a Semite. You know, he spoke Syriac, and uh, which is the kind of the uh, literary form of a uh, literary version of the of the Aramaic language. You know, so he was capable of of reading the Old Testament, you know, in if not Hebrew itself, at least in a Semitic language. And so, you know, it makes sense that he would be kind of so at home in that. Uh, so I find that interesting. I, you know, I'd have to look into more of the scholarship as to to what degree his, you know, you know, if to kind of tally up all of the preponderance of, of moral exempla that he gives in these works. And, you know, if if the if the Old Testament kind of outweighs the New Testament in a sense. Yes, thank you for that, Father. Um, yeah, I've been, I've been uh, actually a little bit. Uh, my turn to be under the weather. Oh no! Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm I, sorry. That's okay. It's minor. I, kind of a chest head thing, and um, took me out of commission this weekend. But oh, uh, yeah, that's okay. It's, oh, God help you. Yeah, no. This is. I, I was just talking to my godfather from New York. They all actually had the exact same thing that we had last week, which was a stomach thing. So, oh my, yeah, it, it's just like you know, this past winter has been the worst uh, in terms of illness ever. It's it's just amazing. But mm. the, the, uh, this um, one quick question: uh, What was the time frame they think this was written? Uh, well, so Saint Ephraim the Syrian lived in throughout basically like the central part of the fourth century. So okay. uh, I think he I forgot his exact dates, but fourth century, kind of like. He was, he was born a couple of decades in and died like a decade or two before the end of the fourth end of the fourth century. Um, now, but as I said, that we don't, you know, there is there is, it's not exactly clear. Certainly, not all of the texts that are part of the Greek Ephrem corpus are by him. Mm -hmm. um, there are there are some that are definitely uh, the works of other patristic authors. Um, but at the same time, though, I, I tend to lean towards the idea that they are actually by him on some level. 
uh, that he they probably were written down by a disciple of his who sat at his feet and kind of recorded them in some capacity. That's in, in exactly the same way that we know happened with St. Macarius of Egypt, for instance, who didn't actually write anything himself, but his disciples did. So I, I think that's probably what we're dealing with here. That's how we wound up with a Greek body of texts independent of the Syriac body. Yeah, it's just, I found it just amazing. I mean, uh, you know, it, 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 it hits home and yet at the same time it warms the soul. Yes, yes. Uh, you, know, it's, it, you, can't, you, can't, you can't leave feeling good about yourself, but you can also leave praising Christ for what he's done for us. Yes, that's right. That's a beautiful way of putting it, Mark. You know, yeah. and and that's that's kind of the the essence, right? You know, of the of spiritual life. We if we just learn about our own sinfulness, then we feel like there's no hope, and we just feel depressed. You yes. know, uh, and if you just focus upon the goodness and mercy of God, then we lo also lose out our place in the equation. You know, mm -hmm. you have to have both. You have to have knowledge of both. You know, yeah, faith working through love. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Amen. Excellent, Mark. Yes, thank you. I don't want to take up any more time. Not at all. No, please. It's a pleasure. Great to talk to you. And about thank that, you. Thank you. Can I ask a quick question? Also, it's Alex. Yes, please, Alex. How are you? <clears throat> but uh, yes, you were talking to Mark right now. But it is. How can I say that? It is not really uh, uh, um, easy to let's say to believe not just kind of not just imagine to really yeah like believe in the fact that uh certain certain things are forgiven to you and you know what i'm talking about like like after you know we all believe in the fact that god forgives us but where where's the border in 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 uh like your sin certain sins was forgiven really truly or not I, I heard from the saints that you you must hate you you have that ability to hate the sin which you mm. uh, previously have done and stuff like that that's one of the one of the signs uh but most of the saints till the end of their life they were weeping about their sins sins anyway mm. right and where is that kind of a conscientious uh, um, ability to understand that not that you're not doing that scene, but you kind of clean after that? Or, yes. Or anything like that. You know what well, I mean? I, I totally understand what you mean. Uh, you know, there are stories like of St. Peter, the apostle, who, right. you know, who de denied Christ. And then he heard the rooster crowing. And the church tradition says that every single day when he heard the rooster crowing, for the rest of his life, he would weep, remembering his sin. But of course, we know also from the gospel that Christ forgave him, right? And he denied him three times. And then Christ asked him at the end of the gospel of St. John, Peter, do you love me? And he says, yes, I love you. And he asked him again, Peter, do you love me? Yes. Uh, and so, you know, three times kind of undoing the threefold denial. So so to what is the what is the balance there? Uh, you know what? I'm going to I'm going to take the easy way out, and I'm going to ask Father Borian to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Alexander, to be uh, to be bluntly uh, direct with with your question, to give you the answer, what the fathers in many cases they what they refer to hate the sin means that those sins who are truly forgiven to us are the sins that we have truly repented for. We never we never fall into. Right. And some saints they even say. If we constantly fall into the same sin, I'm talking not about, let's say, some habit that we have developed and it, we need some time to kind of get rid of that passion, but we are constantly falling into the same sin. Let's say uh, the sin of judging, which we all have. And mm -hmm. we are constantly, we come to the priest and we say, Father, I want to confess that I judge my, my wife, my, my friends, my whatever. And uh, yes, the priest will read us the prayer of absolution of sins, but the sin can truly be forgiven when we have stopped doing that habit, that, that thing. And only then we know that mm -hmm. we have healed from our passion. So the reason why the saints have constantly, even though they became passionless and they don't have, they did not have the same passions like we have, judging or having some other habits and so forth, desires and passions, 
they were completely aware of their fallen human nature that at any moment they can fall into sin. And that is why uh, they hated the sin, uh, humbling themselves that even if they lose their attention for a second, they can fall into that same sin. Uh, to give you a small example, I don't know how much time we're going to have, but there is a story about this elder who was a holy man. And he, under his spiritual authority, had a lot of monks and nuns. One day he was on the deathbed. He received an information by God that he was going to die. So he was getting ready. He thought that he was going to die. So he wanted to say goodbye with all of his spiritual children, monks and nuns included. While they were lining up, kissing his hand and moving out, there was this nun, young one, who came, kissed his hand, not even looked at him, basically. Just, she was doing something that everybody before her was doing and after her. But with the tip of her veil, she kind of, because his left foot was a little bit uncovered from the blanket, she kind of touched him, but not with her body, but with the veil of her garment. And then in he time, at that time, he fell into temptation himself, and he was ashamed of himself, and he was asking God for forgiveness. How can this happen to me when I'm an old man, spending my whole life in the monastery, thinking that I had conquered all the passions? What mm -hmm. happened was basically God revealed to him that this God allowed to happen to him so he can understand and teach his monks and nuns, and through his example, all of us, that the passions can only be conquered with God's help and they will never leave us until our last breath. So that even if we achieve a state of passionless, let's say if I become holy, I'm far from it, but let's say you, you somehow magically you, uh, with a lot of struggle, you become like a Saint Seraphim of Sorrow, someone who obviously was passionless and many other saints, Saint Ephraim of Syria that we're talking today. They were considered to be for themselves the greatest sinners because they knew that the, the spiritual height that they achieved was not because of their own efforts, not because they made they were able to do 1,000 prostrations a day, that they eat salt and bread every day, that they only drink water, and so on and so forth. They went to church all the day and prayed so long, but rather because the God's grace uh, was bestowed upon them, and that's why they achieved that. In other mm -hmm. words, our sins are forgiven when we truly repent for them. Truly, True repentance means that if I have offended my brother or my sister, and I know that that brings me a spiritual death, I will do everything in my power to, to till my last breath to never fall into that same uh, temptation again. Mm -hmm. Imagine it like like shooting a person. I'm I'm not a murderer. I've never killed a human being, but mm -hmm. uh, if you can, if you if you talk to a person who has committed a murder, let's say uh, uh, in a self defense, maybe in war, those people still have dreams of of the people who were uh, who uh, who they killed, who they harmed, even mm -hmm. though it's in self defense, and they repent for them. That's why the church has established a period of penance, that even if let's say someone commits that kind of terrible sin horrible sin even if it's self-defense you still cannot receive holy communion for a certain period of time until a certain period of time of penance has passed why because repentance means changing of our mindset changing of our actions and uh, acting upon it. so uh, if i have uh, let's say truly repented about something i will be a better version of myself next time when i come to confession so i don't have to repeat myself all the time that's why it's very important when we go for confession, when we talk to a spiritual father, to monitor ourselves as well. Are we progressing or we're constantly stuck on the same things? So right. If that's happening that we need to we need to work on ourselves. We need to change something about ourselves. So that's why, why do we fast every year? It doesn't make sense. Every year we go through this seven weeks of fasting. Every it's year good, we do the Christmas good exercise fast. Every of struggle. Year, we do this rep repetitive fasting. We do this repetitive confession. We receive Holy Communion very often so that we can remind ourselves that at any moment, if we're not careful, we can fall away from God and there is no coming back. That's why the church is a mother 
It always brings us together, always puts us together. When we go astray, we remember, uh -huh, now is the time to fast. Let's come back to ourselves. Let's remember that now I have to prepare to receive Holy Communion. Let's go to confession. Let's start to fast. Let's start to pray, do my prayer rule, and we'll come back. So that's why it's very important. Uh, so, the, the, but the true repentance happens within our hearts when we truly stop uh, repeating the sins that we have committed all the time. Uh, there was right. a sense, Ilwan, I think he said a story. I'm sorry for, just I wanted to tell you this. There was this, uh, in his book, uh, uh, Saint Seraphim, uh, Saint Sofroni Saharov talks about on the life of Saint Siluan, how he, in his village, there was this former criminal who was released from prison. But when he came to his house, he was a very despondent man. He would go to church, but not receive Holy Communion. Everybody knew him like a very silent man. He would not talk to anyone. He was obviously living in repentance. Like this person had a heavy burden upon himself. Maybe he did a horrible crime. But he did his time, but now he has to kind of, you know, he was still doing. But one day, since he won on Pascha, after the liturgy, he saw him dancing outside and being all happy and, and joyful. And yeah. they asked him, people, what, 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 what's the matter with you? Are you crazy? I mean, we don't know you in this light. We will, you know, we always look like very despondent, very withdrawn kind of uh, uh not not social being and so forth what this is a tremendous change he said god has forgiven my sin and right. this happened after some period of, of of years so um that's what 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 what, uh, what repentance means that we repent for our sins and we are vigilant not to fall into the same uh, trouble again the same sin yes father Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you yeah. so much. I, I understand. Glory to God. Uh, Father Matthew, I think we're uh, at 7.30. Maybe we can wrap it up. Uh, we'll post this one on um, on YouTube. Unless someone else uh, has to add something or give something, tell something. Then we can maybe uh, finish for today. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> I'll just... Uh, so Father, yeah. Say the prayer. It is truly meet to bless thee, the Theotokos, the ever blessed and most blameless, and mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, and beyond compare, more glorious than the seraphim, who without corruption gave us birth to God, the word, the very Theotokos, thee do we magnify. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, O Lord, bless. To the prayers of our holy fathers, O Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy and save us. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father.